Hallelujah. All right, so we're going to go, <laughs> we're going to be in Romans uh, chapter 7 again tonight. We'll finish it up. Last week I started, uh, so I would call this part 2, and I ended up titling the message last week. I titled it The Broken Engine. Um, and what I was doing was I had already, I was going to call it a spoke, a stick in the spoke. But like I told y'all, Danielle said that I'd already used that title. So I changed it and I said a broken engine. And um, what is, what version is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong version, but you're good. You're in the right version. All right. That's the King James. Okay. That's all we have on the, on the computer. So that works good for people that like King James. Amen. All right, so we called it the broken engine, and so this is part two. We're going to try to finish through Romans chapter 7 tonight. Um, what, something that was recurring, it kept talking about death uh, last week in Romans 7. It talked about death, and then I happened to go back today while I was doing some stuff, and I counted in Romans 6 how many times the concept of death is spoken. So the concept of death is spoken 19 times in Romans 6. Okay, one time the word crucified is used, every other time is died, dead, death. So the point that I'm trying to make with that is, is that that was really the context. And the context, if you'll remember, was what were we dying to in Romans 6? Sin, and our relationship with sin and the power of sin. And we understand that death, what is it talking about? What kind of death is it that word crucified is, is key because it's talking about our death in Christ. I know that seems simple, but we say these things all the time. Sometimes we just got to kind of slow down and rethink it. And so tonight we're going to try to think of some of, of these concepts that we're going to talk about and we're going to explain it. But so in Romans 6, we learned that in our, we, that we became one with Jesus. We have in God's mind through faith, faith, faith is our part. And when we place faith in God's plan, which was ultimately to send his son, Jesus, I know, and I preached on Sunday, that whole salvation history message. And what we came to the conclusion was is that the fall of man had created havoc on the earth and that God began the process of working through his plan of salvation. And what the first step he made was what he called Abraham. And through Abraham, he created a nation. Through the nation, he gave the world Jesus. When you look at it that way, we realize that God's plan required death. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For he, Jesus, became flesh and blood. It says, because the brothers, me and you, were flesh and blood that Jesus also partook of the same so that he could die, he could die, amen, in even the death of the cross, and that the reason why was so that he could take back the power of death from the enemy. And so that no longer, I was kind of paraphrasing, but no longer shall you and I have to live under the fear of physical death because Jesus broke the power of the enemy, amen. And so, so with that said, the idea again was about death and death to the old man and death to the relationship of sin. That's a big thing that you and I need to understand, that the message of the cross is much more than just putting your faith in Christ for salvation, right, so that you can get to go to heaven, but that really and truly faith in Christ, the same way you received him, you received him through faith, is the same way you shall continue to walk in him. And when we're talking about walking, because we're believers, amen, we desire to live a life that brings glory to God. Well, you can't do that on your own. You're not going to be able to do that on your own. And so as you understand that the object of your faith needs to be not how much you pray, not how much you go to church, not what church you go to, although I will say if you're going to a church where they're not preaching the truth, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Nevertheless, uh, it's not about those things. It's about you keeping your faith and understanding to keep your faith in Christ, in him crucified. And what that does is it releases grace into your life. Amen. And it lets you and I walk in resurrection power. Amen? So, again, the concept of death was throughout the verses in chapter 6, and it was specifically talking about the relationship to sin. Then we turned the page, and we went into Romans 7 last week. And in the first few verses, I'm not going to go back and read it again, but there was an illustration of a marriage. You remember that? And what, the main thing I want to remind you of with the illustration of the marriage is not who was the law, not who was the, who was the bride, not, not who, you know. But instead, I want you to be reminded that death changed the relationship. The woman was in bondage under the law, under the law to the, the law of marriage to her husband as long as he was alive. But then he died. And when he died, she was released from the law of marriage to that husband and she was now able to marry another. And then the Bible tells us the whole the big reveal was is that the other was Jesus. So and and he says just as you died 
you too now can be married to another, Christ Jesus, so that you can bear fruit. And so here we see, that we see the overflow of the concept of death taking place again. Well, it's the same death that was talking about in Romans 6. The same way through faith you, in the mind of God, died in Christ and the power of sin and the relationship with sin was broken or there was a change. Supposed, let me just say it like this. There's supposed to be a change in our relationship with sin whenever we become a true believer. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Okay, and so, so that's what happened in the mind of God. Now, this is a very spiritual, and, and it is. Like, I know I'm not trying to call nobody out, but I've heard this more than once, where people said, it just can't, I don't understand, how can it be that easy? And even Brother Chagy said, when he was watching Brother Swaggart in California, he was like, it can't be that easy. Well, there's nothing easy about it, because most of the hard work is on the front end, through the pain, the turmoil, the circumstances, the frustrations, the aggravations. The, 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 at the attacks, the desire to go towards those things that are unholy, the attempts to live for God some other way other than the right way, right? And when all of these things begin to have their way in the heart and the life of the believer, then guess what? Now, that's a lot of pain. Ain't nothing easy about that. That's hard stuff to go through those things, right? Anybody that's been in the faith for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. But then when we come to the end of self, when we come to the end of self and the realization that all of the things that I've been doing in the past haven't been working, listen, that's why a lot of people just turn their back on the faith and never come back. They get frustrated. It's not working. I tried Jesus, and then they end up giving up, and it's like, no, you can't do that. So, so then it's not just as simple. Let me just say this. It is as simple as putting your faith in the right object, but I do need you to understand this. That there's a big difference between understanding something cognitively or intellectually. It sounds right. It's got, it's got to say right. Whenever you say, oh, okay, preacher, then you tell me what the problem is with my lustful thought life. Jesus. Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. Will you tell me what the problem is whenever I want to go buy cocaine or I want to go buy pain pills or I want to go buy Jesus. Yeah. Jesus and his work on the cross. That ought to just sound right to your heart, Right? There ain't nothing wrong with that theology. It's all about Jesus. Okay, well, that's real simple. Well, then why, when I put my faith in Jesus, I still feel driven to go find this stuff that I'm going to look for. Okay? And so what I need you to understand is, is that it's kind of like a gumbo pot. There's a lot of things that are happening in the life of the believer where the Lord is getting us to the place, number one, where he can convince us that that's the answer. Okay, and so many times, though, on the front end, we've been in churches, and I'm not picking on anybody right now, I'm just making a point. We've been in churches where they're not preaching or teaching that. And so we've been brought up, raised up under false doctrine. Okay, we've been raised up under false doctrine, and then that has hindered us. I have talked to a lot of different kind of believers through the years since the Lord has started to give me some understanding. And the worst, some of the worst kinds of believers are ones that just been in like the word of faith doctrine. Okay, the name and claim it doctrine. That, that they think that's the answer. That's the object of their faith. The power of life and death is in the tongue. I know they got a scripture that says that, and it's true. The power of life and death is in the tongue. But that's not, what, that's not the proper prescribed order for victory over the power of sin, that you just quote your victory over sin. No, because now you change the object of your faith. And, and the proper order of things would be the power of life and death is in the tongue. I'm a child of God. I'm a born-again believer. The old man's dead. A new man's been resurrected. And now I'm righteous in the eyes of the Father because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And because of that, hallelujah, grace is going to flow in my life. God is going to give me strength, amen. And I'm going to stand up and I'm going to walk for the Lord. No, you ain't, you're not turning your back on the Lord. No, you're not. You're going to keep on living for God until you take your last breath. And when you take your last breath, hallelujah, you're going to be ushered into the presence of the Lord himself. Amen. That's going to be a good day. <laughs> hallelujah. That's going to be a real good day. But in the meantime, God's going to give you and I strength to live for God today. Amen. All right. So that was the marriage story there. And so now we also covered verse 5. But I just want to kind of talk to you a little bit about this. I was thinking a lot about it today. So it says, for when we were in the flesh. Now, I, I, was, I guess maybe I could do a little writing on the board. I'm pretty sure that the board cleaner will 
cut me some slack, right? All right, so when we were in the flesh, so I just wanted to mention to you, I kind of said it before, the word flesh can be used to describe physical life, right? In other words, when it says something like about Jesus and it says he was born of a woman born, in, born under law or born in the flesh, and it says that about Jesus, it's not talking about his sinful nature because Jesus didn't have a sinful nature. So sometimes the word flesh is just simply describing physical, something physical in opposition to spiritual. But sometimes the word flesh can be describing the sinful nature, okay? Or uh, the, 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 the aspect, the physical aspect of man that's being driven by the sinful nature. Let's, let's put it that way. Can we say it like that? So the, the effect of the sinful nature on the, flesh, on the flesh, but then also there can be this idea of... Let's, let's call it like this, own strength. So you can try to live for God in your own strength, and that would be your flesh. Trying through, that, that would also constitute as a kind of like a system of law. But whenever I'm talking about law, yes, while law, whether it's the Mosaic law or any other kind of law, it, 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 it entails trying to keep rules or keep promises without the right source of strength trying to live holy and a righteous life in your own power, in your own willpower. I know I've shared this before, but I've made this comment before that the first time I heard it was Brother Swaggart, he said, let me tell you something right now, the power of sin is more powerful than your willpower. Dude, when he said that, I didn't even like it. When he said that, I got it. I, ooh, my, something rose up in me. I had just started listening to the radio. I was still going to the other church the church before the last church, and I was listening to that on the radio and something rose up on the inside of me because guess what? I wanted to think highly of myself. But all I had to do was do a little self-reflection and it wouldn't have been that difficult to figure out. Old boy's drinking 40s in the backyard. He's looking at stuff on the internet he's not supposed to look at. He's got stuff going on all up in his head. He's dipping a can and a half a day of skull still. He's hiding it, spitting it out so nobody. It wasn't hard if you're just willing to do a little bit of self-reflection to realize. And everybody in the church says, well, hallelujah, I don't have those problems. But you got something. If you do, and especially if you don't understand the message of the cross, you got something. In your life. And you might still have a little something, something right now that the Lord doesn't want to set you free from. Amen. Right? Amen. Gossiping tongue, lying tongue, doing other people dirty. Right? Thinking bad about folk. Thinking bad about folk. Oh, yeah, you know, like looking down others with your spiritual superiority. Come on. Come on, somebody. Help me out. We all got stuff. And some of it, yeah, but my stuff ain't as bad as yours was, preacher. Well, Hallelujah. You blessed little holy thing, you. You just do it so well, right? But you get the point. I mean, because, listen, I've even thought that way before myself. And sometimes I still think I'm doing better than you, right? Because it wants to stay in our head, in our heart. It's not right. I'm not saying it's right. It's wrong. All right. So, but what I want you to understand, though, is that when it says, for when we were in the flesh, I want you to understand that and I was thinking about this today. How do you describe this? I want to say that this flesh is kind of like a spiritual status. When you're in the flesh, the idea here is that the sinful nature is moving and operating. So let's look at it like a spiritual status. Like, where, where are you right now in your walk, brother or sister? I'm, I'm in the spirit. Okay, or no, I'm in the flesh. So it's, it's a spiritual status. Like, in other words, it's the condition of where I am right now. If I, I can, and now this right here is talking about, it sounds like in the verbiage and everything like that, that, that what he's talking about is before the faith. So before the faith, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members and brought forth death. So the spiritual status was that he was in the flesh. So he was being overwhelmed. Sin was aroused in his heart and in his life. Many of you and I know that before Christ, you know, and some of us at various levels were the sinful nature was aroused in our life. That's not a good place to be. I mean, sometimes it'd be really, really bad. 
right? And so the sinful nature was aroused in our life. But I got to tell you, that can happen to believers also. The sinful nature can be aroused in your life. And the sinful nature can be moving and, and operating in your life. And two things that I need you to understand that will allow the sinful nature to come back in is lust and law. Okay, I want you to know that. Well, what are you trying to say? I'm just trying to make it easy for you to be able to remember lust and law. Because, see, there's two kinds of sins. That, at least that's what I'm saying. Lust is something that you desire and want and you're not supposed to have it. Okay? Or, and, then you, and so, like, if you open up the door to it, then what can happen is the power of sin can begin to come back alive. Right? And the problem that you run into is, is that it makes it difficult to close the door because if we're honest with one another, we wouldn't have wanted that thing to begin with if it wasn't something that didn't look good, taste good, smell good, feel good, something, something, something like that. And then once we taste it and, and feel like it's good, we don't want to let it go and we hold on to it. And then, the, and then if it's out of God's will, the longer we hold on to it, the, the more access the enemy and the power of sin has and our heart and in our life. So that's the first thing, because I don't want you to, so sin breeds sin, but guess what? Embracing the law for righteousness or, for, or trying to embrace the law for right living will also inflame and arouse the passions of sin. And, and the sad thing is, is that, so in the Apostle Paul's life when he's, so let me just say this, if I was gonna try to describe to you the letter to the Romans. When, when the Apostle Paul writes, this is, my, this is my opinion and this is the opinion of other commentators that I've read behind. When the Apostle Paul writes the letter to the Romans, he writes it from the city of Corinth. If I'm, I'm shooting from the hip, that's what I'm pretty sure. He's writing it from the city of Corinth. <laughs> and when he writes the letter, at this point in time he's writing it, he obviously understands the pathway to victory because he's telling us the pathway to victory. But in Romans 7, so in Romans 6, he, 6, he explains how we died to sin. Then in Romans 7, he begins to describe the connection to the, of the law to causing sin to be re-aroused in our life. But, then, but, but, another, but another thing about this particular situation in Romans 7 specifically, he, he begins to share with us instances from his own life after Christ where he himself struggled with putting his faith in the wrong thing. And then that allowed sin, the passions of sin to be aroused in his life. Now, it's, now that's a hard thing for some. Well, not the apostle Paul, brother, because I saw a painting of him and Peter and they had halos on their head. And so therefore they're saints. I'm like, come on, man. But is that not true though? Did you not isn't there some kind of weird spiritual something going on in our minds and in our hearts about the disciples and thinking that they never did nothing wrong until we come to the realization that, like, that is the most ridiculous thing? When you actually read the Bible, you start to realize people had some issues, right? But anyway, so that's what the Apostle Paul is doing in chapter 7. So I, the main point I want you to know is, is that, listen, the sinful nature can be aroused and un, is always aroused in unbelievers, but it can also be aroused in believers. And I want you to know that when it says, when we were in the flesh, that, that's, a, that's talking about a spiritual state, that that's kind of like where, we, where a person may be at that time, right? So he says, but now we've been delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so... Just as we died in Christ to the power of sin, at that same time, we also died from the power that the law held over us. So, because now, now, one of the things we need to understand about the law, and we're going to probably get into this a little bit more as we keep moving, but one of the things we, under, we have to understand about the law, the law is, is not bad. You, it's very important that you and I understand that. The law is not bad. The law is God. The law is of God. The law reveals God's heart. The law is great for instruction. The law will tell you when something's right and something's wrong. Okay, but if you try to please God by keeping the law in your own strength, that's the problem. And part of the reason that God allowed the law to come into existence was to prove to man that he needed Jesus. Okay, um, and so... So then it says in verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, here you go. God forbid. And then he says, nay, I had not known sin, 
but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, real quick, could you do me a fit? 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 Could you do me a Justified in his sight, for by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. Now, Haley, I know you're young, you're young, and so that means you're more computer savvy than us. Whenever you have time, you need to find out if there's a way for you can highlight stuff in this app. Not right now, but someday. Find out if we can highlight stuff. See, because I'd like you to be able to highlight knowledge right there, but that's okay. If, you can't, if it can't be done, you don't have to do it right now, but if it can't be done, then that's fine because it's probably just a little cheap app that we have there. But I want you to understand that the, but the, the law, not only does it reveal our, it reveals to us, it gives us knowledge of what sin is. I want you to see it. So the law is not unholy. The law is not sin in and of itself. No, it's when we try to approach the law as our source for victory. Now, and again, well, I'm, I don't have no Ten Commandments in my house. You're missing the point. The basis of law had to do with performance. It says it. He, as a matter of fact, look what it says. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Well, one of the reasons why the deed, no, by the deeds of the law no flesh shall be justified in his sight is because nobody could keep the law. Because James said it. He said, anybody that fails in one point of the law has failed the whole law. It's not like, and, and again, I know I tried to share this with y'all a couple of weeks back. The difference between imputed righteousness which means righteousness that is given to you as a gift and is laid upon you, which is the righteousness of Jesus that was given to you as a gift when you believed in Christ. That's imputed righteousness. That's a gift from God versus relative righteousness, which in relation to such and such, I'm pretty righteous. But, that, but you nor them, y'all aren't the plumb line. You don't, you don't base your, righteous, your level of righteousness in your Christianity off of somebody else. No. The plumb line or the measuring tool is Jesus because he is the righteousness of God. Amen? All right. So Paul says, no, sin's not, it's, law's not the problem because if I didn't have the law, then I wouldn't have even known what sin was. And he says, because had I not, had I not for I had not known lust, or I would not have known what lust was, except the law had said, you shall not covet. So again, you got to remember the word lust. When I say lust, we always think of sexuality, because that's just, we use that term to describe that. But the word in the Greek is epithumia, and it really describes, it can even be used in a good context. Okay, it can say, I, I can't remember the exact scripture, but it, there's a scripture that talks about the spirit what the spirit lusts for you, <laughs> and, and the spirit and the flesh lust, they, they lust against each other, okay? And so, so the point, though, is, is that the word lust is a desire for something, but depending on the context, it can be something good or it can be something bad. So the Holy Spirit lusts that you would give your heart completely over to God, see? And so in that sense, that's the desire of the Holy Spirit for each and every one of our lives. So the word lust, though, is in a negative context, can describe your desire for anything that you're not supposed to have a desire for. You know? And then, and then that, the, the trouble that we get into is when we start nitpicking stuff and we're like, yeah, but I ain't never committed adultery, but, it, but, you, but, you, bound with, but you lust. You lusted after that other person's woman or you lusted after that other person's possessions. But it's not that big of a deal. The Lord, no, 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 hold on. By, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You either kept the whole law or you didn't. And, you, and if you broke the law in one place, you broke the whole law. And, you, and we need to come to grips with the reality of our mind. And if we still think that, then maybe something's wrong with our own heart. Like we're not seeing it the way that the Lord would want to see it. All right, but then he goes on to say this. He says, but sin taking occasion. Now, you can't see a lot of other, these other, because I'm not on the screen, but it, look, the ESV says, sin seized an opportunity. The NASB says, uh, sin took an opportunity. And even your favorite version, I know that's not true, the NIV says, sin 
sees the opportunity that was afforded by the commandment. That's actually a pretty good translation right there, okay? Sin sees the opportunity that was afforded to it by the commandment. Now, don't, don't go to sleep on me because, look, I know we're getting technical here, but this is some, this is some, good, some good stuff, okay? So what I need you to understand is, is that sin took an occasion. Oh, I'm sorry. We're in Romans chapter 7, verse 8. <laughs> I got to I got to remember to tell y'all where we are. So we're in Romans chapter 7 verse 8. That wasn't Haley's fault, that was my fault. All right. Sin took an occasion by the commandment and it wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. All right. So before we get into that big concupiscence words, let's look at this. Sin took an occasion Sin was afforded an opportunity. Sin seized an opportunity. The idea here is, really, if you look it up in the Greek, the definition describes a base of operations. So whenever we went to go bomb, wherever we bombed, we use a base of operations. I tried to say this before, and Sean Pereira corrected me because he was over there in Desert Storm. But the point is, is that we needed to bomb. Where did we bomb? Was it, we didn't bomb Kuwait. Did we bomb Iraq? Wherever we did, we had to use one of those, we used Saudi Arabia or something as a base of operation so that we could fly our sorties because we needed to be able to get there and fuel up and all that stuff. So the, the point is, is this, is that the law or the commandment is serving as a base of operations. Another way that you could maybe say it is that if you had your armor on, sometimes people might find that there's a chink in their armor. So the idea is, is that sin does not have power and control in our life as long as we are operating and moving in the right way that God has called us to move. But when we add commandments or law to our walk with God, then now sin uses that as a base of operations. It uses that as an opportunity to begin to come in and to begin to wreak havoc. So the problem that most Christians are living, usually, a lot more more times than not, and why they can't get free, is because they don't even understand the proper object of faith, which is the simplicity of the gospel is that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them who are perishing, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, when we say that the message of the cross is the power of God, what we're saying there is that when Jesus died on the cross, he did not have any sin, and that really and truly he was dying in our place, amen, because we were the ones that were guilty with sin. We were the ones that we had a debt that we couldn't pay, and he, had a, he, had a, he paid a debt that he didn't know. And so Jesus dying on the cross, amen, allowed an exchange to take place. I know I say this a lot, but we were given Jesus' righteousness, and he took upon himself our sinfulness, and and he's done it for the whole world. But uh, third time, I'm not losing my mind. I don't want y'all to think I am. Third time, illustration, ATM, pin number, Jesus Christ in him crucified. The account is full, my friend. It's waiting for you to go punch in the pin, faith in Christ, to receive your disbursement so that you can get your allotted inheritance, which is right now on earth, living and walking for God and receiving the grace that you need in order to do that. And can I got good news for you, my friend. God wants you to do it. You know why he wants you to do it? Because he wants your life to give glory to him. Hallelujah. So he's in it with you. He wants to go before you. He wants to give you the victory. Amen? Amen. But when we operate according to law and you go to churches and listen, God bless their heart. You know, but not, not, not so much God bless their heart if somebody's gone before them and told them on multiple occasions that they're not telling it the right way and that they're prideful in their heart and the preacher don't want to submit, doesn't want to humble himself. Not submit to the person that told them, not submit to another preacher. Submit to the living God that, that sent his son to die and wrote it down on the papyrus for us to be able to read it, but they refuse because that's not what I learned from my, my traditions of my fathers. I can't break ranks with the rest of the folk. No, dude, you're living under a spirit of fear. You're living under a spirit of control, and you probably got a spirit of control over your people. And they're over there languishing and dying because they don't want to get up and walk out, okay, because, they're, because control is gripping their hearts. Anyway, 
And they preach a works-based message. You, in order to be free, you got to do, 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 do. And what ends up happening is, is that sin takes an occasion by the commandment. And so the way my old walk was, Lord, I need to be set free. Go up to the front for prayer. Everybody does all this. Lord, help us. Every, and it's the same thing every time. You go up there, they lay hands on you, you fall down, you get up, you go home, you come back next week, you go up to the front, they lay hands on you, you fall down, you go home, and it's just repetitive behavior and nobody's ever getting set free because they're putting their faith in the man of God laying their hands on them. They're putting their faith in rebuking the devil, putting their faith in how much Bible they read, putting their faith in how much they go to church, fasting, speaking in tongues, all that. And it's all good stuff. <laughs> it's all good stuff. But that was the problem with the other side of the tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, before they knew good and evil, they only knew God. That's where we got to get back to that place. Where we put our hope and trust in God and not the good nor the evil. Amen. All right. <laughs> so he says, for without the law, sin was dead. And then this is really where we stopped the last time, verse 9. And I told you already that many commentators have, look, let's go to verse 9. Um, many commentators have the, um, have the idea that this was before the Apostle Paul was saved. And I explained that to y'all last time, gave you the little illustration from Brother Larson. of the rub Oh, Brother Larson's coming September 11th, by the way. He'll be here for the 930 service. Amen. He's going to be, he's going to bring some books, uh, Bibles and stuff like that too. You, like, if you ever wanted to buy. So the church buys several Bibles because we still hand them out to people as gifts. But uh, some, some of y'all might like to do that too sometimes. And when he comes, he's got the best rates on them Bibles. I'm telling you, man. He, he really cuts us a deal on those Bibles. So I'm just saying, if you thought, you know, and I asked him to bring uh, several. All right. So, so I was alive Without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And so what we talked about was is that while most commentators take the position that this was before the Apostle Paul was of age to understand the law, that he was alive without, uh, without sin, uh, without the law. But we've already established in the beginning of this chapter that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And the context of the living was directly connected to dying in Christ, right? Because that's what it said in the first four verses. Y'all remember that when we covered it, right? And so then I also talked to you about the word revived. It's only used twice. It's used, I'm sorry. It's used twice in the book of Romans. And the other time it's used is describing Jesus, that Jesus revived. Well, Jesus was alive. He died. And then he came back to life. So in this verse, it can't be before the apostle Paul got saved. It was after the apostle Paul got saved. So I was alive once without the law, and then the commandment came, sin was dead, but it revived, and then he began to die spiritually. So what did he do? What kind of commandment did he add? I don't know. I, remember, I always thought it was funny when Brother Larson would say that. He would say, I don't know what it was he did. Did he add a pork, I will not eat a pork chop sandwich to make himself more holy? Now, he just used that as an example. I know it sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but, it sound, 